Lovely. Um, it's I ironic that uh, the environmental NGO are the only people wearing ties in the entire room, and it shows how the balance of power has moved. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much for inviting us here tonight. I've learned so much in the last two presentations. You won't learn quite as much in this one, um, but what I am going to do is uh, touch on some of the really fundamental ground-level issues that both uh, Amy and Brian have brought up in their fantastic presentations. Cool Earth, as Frank says, was started 10 years ago, and uh, in 2007 we'd had 50, 60 years of the environmental movement protecting rainforest, and half of it has disappeared, okay? So something wasn't quite right, and you can blame it on the drivers to deforestation, the soya farmers, the cattle ranchers, the loggers, but without a doubt there was something wrong in the ways in which we were trying to protect rainforest. And the fact that there are 638 rainforest charities out there also suggested you probably didn't need another one using the same solution of putting up fences and declaring a reserve. So Cool Earth was created to be a bit of a think tank, to experiment, to kind of celebrate things that go right as well as things that go wrong in how we protect rainforests, and that's exactly what we are. So we're an experimental organisation that really is just sucking in sea, kicking the tyres, figuring out what will work and what doesn't work. And the other thing we've done is we try to get away from this, covering our prep, which every charity uh, does. I used to work in investment banking. That was far less competitive than environmental charities. So everything we do, we learn. And God, do we bore people with our transparency. Every screw-up, every disaster, every canoe that's gone missing, every $100 snaffled away from someone we trusted that hasn't turned up, we'll, we'll tell you about in our annual report. Because we really do believe that one of the big problems in terms of the environmental movement to date, as with so many other organisations, is the fact that they claim to have transparency, but really there's very little um, around. OK, um, we've, heard, we've seen this chart in various different forms. Amy certainly showed it. So she had a bigger number. So this is how much carbon we're throwing out into the atmosphere as um, humankind. And deforestation accounts for around 17% of it. Okay? So you're including land use change and other things. But if you just look at tropical deforestation, it's around 17% of the total carbon budget. Not a huge amount, you might say. And certainly there are really big ones you can get your teeth into with industry and energy and the like. But it's the only one on this pie chart that doesn't have a 30-year-plus depreciation cycle. And the points we've heard about electric cars, spot on. But when will we have more uh, cars being electric rather than um, internal combustion engine. Equally, the things we've heard about PV, it's going to be great, it's going to be huge, but it is taking a bit of time because when you put all your money into a coal power, uh, power station in China, then you're probably going to make sure that that works around and you know, um, probably lives out its normal life. So the interesting thing about deforestation, it's the one that we can really tackle the here and the now. And if you talk to pretty much anyone, the economic benefits, both to the local people and indeed to the globe, of keeping the forest standing far outweigh a bit of pulp that it provides or a bit of farmland that it provides that normally goes to Cerrado, rubbish savanna in no time at all. So just as um, we were established 10 years ago, um, this was really being studied hard by the UN and all the great bodies that we've heard about. Um, but it was also a time when actually deforestation was changing dramatically. So sorry, I mean, when you look at this chart, you think deforestation, yeah, it's guys going out with a couple of bulldozers and a shipping chain between them, taking out forest and doing this. And it was that, and then it changed, because something actually worked very well to address deforestation. We had really successful consumer boycotts. We had really successful um, big companies actually tidying up their supply chain and taking the unnecessary deforestation out of it. And as a result, this, you know, which we know so well from very successful Greenpeace campaign, stopped this industrial deforest, this clear-cutting, actually declined dramatically. And all of a sudden, this wasn't the major cause of deforestation. It was this. It was degradation. It was small gangs of predatory loggers, you know, five or six guys with chainsaws going in and taking out the valuable trees. It was people returning from the Goma refugee camps to where they were living in DR Congo and actually needing to harvest the forest for fuel wood because that's all they had. It was uh, small communities that had, you know, 90% levels of malaria and the only way they could access any cash was by selling out a few trees here and there. And the trouble with this is that PepsiCo sorting out their supply chain won't address it. Equally, Apple doing some marvellous, marvellous things in terms of how their packaging is put together won't address this, because these are the result of negotiations made on muddy riverbanks and small uh, tracks in the middle of the rainforest. But when put together, it was actually generating, getting on for 11 12% of emissions globally. And therefore, because... The environmental movement and the deforestation, uh, sorry, the um, uh, rainforest movement had very much been focusing on a different way 
it wasn't working, so we didn't actually need a new approach. This is where Cool Earth came in. Um, and what do we do? We did something very, very simple, because those are the only things that ever work. So we said to a few communities who had come to us, who had been offered small payments, $10,000 here and there from logging companies, um, saying, okay, if you don't pay out to the logging company, we'll give you slightly less than they're gonna offer you, but we promise to be back next year and help you build livelihoods from things that don't require the rainforest to be uh, cut down. Cacao is an obvious one. Coffee is another obvious one. These are crops that generally actually need a rainforest canopy. If you want to get the top end, Criollo, with the delicate overtones and the taste flavor notes and you know, the huge amounts that you'll sell, uh, well, the huge amounts you'll get from Mars Brothers when you sell to them. So we started putting together small income ideas and they worked. And we said, OK, all we want in return are three things. One, the rainforest stays in place. The canopy isn't chopped down. Two, um, everyone has a view of how any money you raise from us is spent. So you've got to have clear um, uh, meeting notes, and we need to be able to award it you. And then the final thing is, at the end of every year, can you just tell your neighbors how it's going? Because we don't want to be white guys going and trying to market our idea. If, it's ha if you're happy with it, tell your neighbors. If you're unhappy with it, tell your neighbors. Um, but it worked very well, and we started off in Peru, where a small community called Kanatavishi um, came to us, and uh, after a year, they were happy. Their um, cacao income had doubled, and they told nine other communities. In two years, those nine other communities had told another nine, so we're up to 81. Uh, we're now protecting more forest in Peru than any other um, two communities, than any other uh, NGO in the country. We also uh, now have our f fingerprints on the national uh, forest policy in Peru because they say it's a great approach. It's cheap, it's simple, and it's transparent. We then moved to um, an exciting place, DR Congo. We thought Peru was post-conflict because the Shining Path had been operating where we worked. And actually, the valleys where we worked, 20% of global cocaine comes from there. So it's a fairly hairy place. Nothing compared to DR Congo. So the Goma concentration camps were emptying. The forest was being completely ripped apart. Um, by families who had no other choice but basically to harvest it. So we went and started putting fuel-efficient stoves. We started finding some of the crops that they could sell in market. We parts to put together better market access to Kinshasa. And now we're protecting um, half a million acres in DR Congo. And then we thought, well, where else? Because actually, we don't want to have flags on the map just for the sake of it. We don't want to have big numbers. Um, where it's very different to these two places, but is, you know, uh, an area that really needs attention. And it's Papua New Guinea. So DR Congo was where Brazil was in 1965, okay? Papua New Guinea is where Borneo was in 1975. And exactly the same will happen to it unless the local people, who have fantastic land rights, I mean, it's a Commonwealth country, they, they operate under the same rights that you do in Middlesex. Giving them the actual wherewithal to take control of that land and that forest has meant that now we're actually seeing the advance of palm, which has been a big, big issue in um, PNG, actually come to an end in the areas we're working in um, Milne Bay. And in terms of... Uh, pounds for punch, you're protecting probably an acre there, which is 260 tonnes of CO2, for around 50 pounds a year. So going back to my earlier point about you know, needing to decarbonise the economy, but a lot of invested capital already in there, this, we believe, is one of the best um, ways of actually getting a big uh, punch for your pounds. And delightfully, we're now regarded by some very smart people. Um, Oxford's my favorite one, William McCaskill, but also in the US, giving what we can. The most effective charity at combating climate change there is around. But this is an advert, so what I'll do instead is look at the data that we're obsessed with. Everything we do is put into some form of spreadsheet by a team who, I mean, calling them anal doesn't even get close. I mean, they really have put together some extraordinary work. And we can now demonstrate without... Um, any, any, um, uh, any doubt that in the areas where we operate, the average deforestation rate, and this is in PNG, DR Congo, and uh, Peru, uh, is 29%. Where we operate, it's down to less than 1%. We think we can get it below that. And that's because the people who have the biggest incentive, the biggest interest in keeping those rainforest trees standing are the ones who are actually controlling all of our projects. How do we do all this? It was tech. Okay. And we think, you know, um, I have three teenage daughters, and they love a mobile phone. But God, introduce them to the Ashen Inca, and they would be knocked out of the water. They um, have taken to our uh, um, providing uh, mobile phones to alert to loggers coming in, to actually uh, monitor the state of the forest, to actually um, ensuring that they're able to patrol their forest effectively far more quickly than we could have possibly thought. Now, when Cool Earth was launched, this is deliberately ugly. Don't sort of sneer at it too bad. When Cool Earth was launched, Google Maps have been going six months. 
So we were all over that, and we were the first environmental NGO to use Google Maps in a horrible way. I mean, this is <laughs> sort of a MySpace generation, to actually show people where they were protecting forest. Um, and things have got a bit better than then, but we've actually still used exactly the same approach, namely, People talk about the rainforest and think of something 3,000 miles away full of monkeys and no one else. In actual fact, these are places full of people who have you know, lived in them and they're as, just as a managed, um, a managed landscape as um, I know, the Sussex Downs. But unless you actually give people a clear location that they can actually see, ideally in real time, we have a fantastic series of conversations going on with Planet Labs, which we'll get on to, um, unless you can actually see it in quasi-real time, then it's very difficult for people to engage and relate to it. But uh, this is what we did early on. First of all, we gave all of the organisations and all the communities working with us full access to all the tech we were doing. So we probably got through about um, 400 laptops to the um, extremities of the rainforest in the first five years. But it was worth it because they were collecting all the data and they were putting it on our site. We started with very simple tools, literally painting the most valuable trees and monitoring it every day. But then we came across some fantastic devices that basically tell you if the trees are going like that or going like that. And if trees are interfered with in any way, um, the whole of the community is informed instantly, which was a big step forward in 2011. And that meant that the communities themselves were actually able to put together very clear maps of the state of their forest. And as Frank says, um, the thing we do is protect um, community forest. But the great thing about that is generally these are on the arcs of deforestation. So everything to the um, west in Peru is X forest, um, slash and burn, uh, savanna, everything to the right, lush, wonderful Eden. And if you actually do create an effective shield, then you're protecting all of that stuff to the right. So they're actually able to put together their own maps. And this is just an example. So this is where we're operating, bottom. And these are identical areas to the, le uh, to the north. And basically the beige colouring is degradation. And when we put that together, we can see as soon as we put community ownership in place. So when we started this analysis, these were identical, not a single tree being lost. Contested ownership where we weren't operating compared to community ownership where we ensured that everyone had decent tenure has instantly um, arrived in very, very little clearance at all. And this is why the Peruvian government are now using this in all their forest policy. And the other thing we do, because everyone likes a picture of a... Um, rainforest animal is put camera traps in everywhere we operate. Actually, camera traps and acoustic traps. So at dawn and dusk every day, we have 20-second uh, audio segments taken from all our projects, put it in some lovely software that tells you exactly what the species are. And that's a very, very effective way of saying what species are at the bottom of the pyramid. The way to show what species at the top of the pyramid are these things, and that's a, a, a spectacled bear, so that's Paddington, and that's in blue. And that is a crown pigeon. So two examples of fauna and flora, of, of fauna rather, one in Peru, one in Papua New Guinea, right at the top of the pyramid, and if they're there, and if they're in number, then your rainforest is safe and intact. <laughs> and then the final thing we do is some really, now this is a video, I wonder if it'll work. No. <laughs> anyway, so this is a flyover, and basically this was... I know. Far more adept. That or a daughter. But anyway, this, to the right, to the top, you'll see this is a, a, a sawyer. Um, plantation, and it's all the same colour, and if I'd shown you the wonderful video, we would have swept over in majestic glory, just to show how dull and uh, how you just have a single species there and nothing living at all. In comparison, and this is uh, where we're starting to operate in PNG. And that variety of colour, that kaleidoscope, is basically just biodiversity writ large. And uh, that's probably the sh uh, clearest demonstration that uh, what we set out to do in 2007 in terms of working with local people and a bit of clever tech to protect rainforest has worked. Um, for 2025, I'm I, I say this to Frank occasionally, he doesn't believe me, but Cool Earth will not exist in 2025. Charities are not businesses. We're not here to service a pension liability and uh, make sure that everyone's in a job. We should be here to achieve certain goals, to achieve certain missions. And I hope by 2025, before that, we will have actually put together a toolbox of means of protecting rainforest for communities that anyone can use and that we don't need to do any of that and actually it can be shared entirely. And uh, then Cool Earth will actually just be a sort of a, an open source resource. It's what we're already building, but by then we'll have all the data in a row. Uh, we have some lovely backers. Uh, my favourite's this chap, um, who you might recognise. That's very 1990s, isn't it? <laughs> it's coming up like that. Anyway, saying the biggest difference to our whole lives. Um, 
he's still saying that. Um, we hope um, more and more people learn about Call Earth and get involved because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is be an important part of the short-term decarbonisation that we've heard about so much. And uh, so far, it does seem to be working, not least without the help of Funders Pledge. So it's been a real delight to talk to you. Thank you very much.